Well, good morning. And welcome to the First Congregational United Church of Christ, Ashland, Oregon. And uh, my name is Brad Gruy. I will be your host this morning for our time of worship. And we would like to, we say, peace be with you. Shalom. Whoever you are and wherever you're located this morning and wherever you are on your own journey of this life, we want you to know that, uh, that the beloved that we name God loves you and we will try <laughs> to love you and be as nice to you as we can as we all uh, stumble together trying to follow Jesus on this way of radical love what we what we seek here is connection not perfection and we are delighted that uh, this morning through the wonders of technology and the, uh, that we can all be together so thank you for being here and bringing your whole self just as you are i'm going to turn it over to the very lovely and talented sherry morgan who will lead us in our call to worship Thank you, Fred. To pray is to regain a sense of the mystery that animates all beings, the divine margin in all attainments. Prayer is our humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. So join me for the next part. Is all we can offer in return. Who is worthy to be present at the constant unfolding of time? Here we are amidst the meditation of the land, the songs of the water, the humility of the flowers, flowers wiser than all alphabets. Suddenly we feel embarrassed, ashamed of our complaints and clashes in the face of tacit glory. How strange we are in the world. Only one response can maintain us. Gratefulness for the gift of our unearned chance to serve, to wonder, to love life and each other. It is gratefulness which makes our small souls great. Please join us as you are able in singing hymn number 286, Spirit, spirit of gentleness.
So the reading for this morning is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip.
you so much, Carl. I, when I hear that music, I, I, I'm trying to go back to my childhood. I, either am I supposed to be Fred Rogers or Davy and Goliath? I, I know that was music from one of those shows, and I'm the wrong Fred. I'm not Fred Rogers, that's for sure. But anyway, welcome. So uh, let's say a prayer, and we'll see, uh, see where this text takes us this morning. Dear loving God, um, we ask that, uh, that your blessing would be on these moments together, that you would uh, somehow use uh, the words that will come from my mind and heart uh, to communicate uh, your love for us and the great truth that you are with us in this interim time where we find ourselves as a church. God, I pray that you would filter the words that come through me, that they would be uh, a, a help, a blessing for us all, and that you would filter all of our ears as we hear. Uh, and God, it's our desire that is a result of all this stuff that we do, the, 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 the playing of the piano, the singing of the music with Diana, the technology that Phil is making all happen, pieces of us that are in Portland and LA and other places, uh, Gold Beach or somewhere abandoned, somebody said they were and here in the sanctuary, that through all of this, that we really would become more the, the people that you dream us to be the faith community that you want us to be in this time in this place so god we ask your help to do this we know the the these requests are not accomplished by our willing it but very much dependent upon the power of your spirit and so we ask that you would send your spirit to shape us mold us guide us this morning as it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So this, I, one of the reasons I love being a uh, guest preacher is I get to pick everything. I get to pick the texts. And, and this is one of my favorite texts. For me, this is an archetypal story to use Jungian language. And for, because it, it's a story about Jacob but it's also a story about each of us and the struggles that we go through in our life. So to, uh, to unpack this and give you a little context for what's going on in this text this morning, the main character is one of the three Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaqub, Jacob. Now, the story and the context of this was Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, had uh, twins, twin boys. And the story is, is the, the day that they were born, Esau was the first to come forth from his mother's womb. But Jacob had a hold of Esau, 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 Esau's, that's easy for you to say, Esau's heel and tried to pull him back in the womb so that Jacob could be the firstborn. Because in that time and place in that culture, to be the firstborn son was like hitting the lottery. Because later on, when inheritances were doled out, the firstborn son got twice as much as everybody else. And the firstborn son would become the head of the clan, the head of the tribe. And so being the firstborn son is a big deal. And so the legend was that Jacob tried to pull Esau back in the womb so Jacob could be the first one out and be the firstborn. But uh, that didn't happen, and Esau was the firstborn. And so they gave this little baby, this child, the name Yaqub in the Hebrew, Jacob, and it literally meant surplanter. In our language of today, it would mean like little con man. Because in that time and place, to name someone was to, uh, you, you wanted to identify their character or who they were. It was more than just what you called somebody. It was a moniker of, of all that you stood for. 
And so here's this little kid who's named Con Man. Always like. So can you imagine growing Can little Con Man come out and play today? Or little Con Man this? Or little, little Con Man come to dinner? That's what he heard his whole... So it reinforced into his psyche, into his soul, that he was a selfish little manipulative son of a gun. All his life growing up. And that's who he became. As the story unfolds in Genesis for us, uh, Esau was a big, strong guy, vibrant hunter, athletic, good at everything he did. And Jacob was the guy that just sort of hung around the tent and read, and, you know, uh, more of a, a thinker than a doer. Esau was the big doer. Well, one day Esau had been out working hard and he came in and he was starved and Jacob was a chef among other things and it created some stew and Esau was hungry he said I want something to eat and Jacob said well I'll trade you I'll trade you what I got for your birthright now Esau even though he was big and strong and accomplished wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer and so he figured well if I'm going to starve to death my birthright's not going to do me any good so yeah Give me some food and you can have the birthright. Which was a big deal. But Esau didn't consider it a big deal. Which was part of his own weakness and story. And so Jacob connived the birthright out of Esau. And then later, when their father was, was aging, uh, Jacob and his mother conned Isaac into giving... Uh, or conned... Yeah, Isaac, into giving Jacob the blessing of the firstborn. He dressed up like his brother Esau, put on a costume, and even put on smell goods like Esau wore, so that Jacob, whose eyesight was failing, thought it was Esau, and gave Jacob the blessing that was intended for Esau. So Esau was so angry at how he had been connived by little con man that he was going to kill him. And Jacob's mother said, you better get out of town because your brother's going to kill you. And so Jacob flees to his mother's brother's house, Laban, Uncle Laban. Now, Uncle Laban was a good con man in his own right. So Jacob flees to Laban's house and falls in love with one of Laban's daughters, his, his cousin uh, Rachel. And he cuts a deal with Laban, says, I'll work for you for free for seven years but you got to let me marry your daughter, Rachel. And Laban agreed. Now, Laban was a good con man, too. So on the night of the wedding, Laban pulled a big switcheroo, and Jacob didn't marry Rachel. He married Rachel's older sister, Leah, who he was not in love with. And so somehow, in the silliness of it all, he wakes up the next morning, realized he's married to the wrong woman. I mean, this is all in the Bible. I am not making any of this up. <laughs> It's there. So Jacob cuts a deal with Laban again and says, look, I'll work another seven years. Let me marry Rachel. I want to marry Rachel. So Laban agrees. But now during this 14 years of laboring for Uncle Laban to get to marry the woman that he wanted, Jacob gamed the system and made sure his own flocks and herds really grew. And so he amassed great wealth at Uncle Laban's expense while it pretending to be Laban's supervisor. And so Uncle Laban, at the end of 14 years, Uncle Laban's not happy with the way it's turned out because now Jacob's got all this wealth. And so Laban is a threat to Jacob. So Jacob has to flee Laban's house. So in the middle of the night, he grabs his wives, his concubines, his kids, all the stuff he owns, his sheep, his goats, everything he owns, and takes off in the middle of the night. And so he's thinking, well, maybe I'll go back home. Maybe Esau's cooled off by now. <laughs> and so he gets word that Esau and 500 men are on their way out to meet him. And he thinks, oh, he's going to come kill me. And so it's the night before the big meeting with Esau. And they're by the, the stream of the river Jabbok. And he puts all his wives and kids and everything he owns on one side of the river. And he camps on the other side, thinking, well, if Esau and the men attack me, It'll take them a long time to get across the river and, and my family will have a chance to escape. And it's the night before the big meeting. 
And Jacob is between a rock and a hard place. All he has been, his whole life, his conniving, his manipulative, his, his, his selfishness, his gaming every system for his own benefit has come home to roost. And he's afraid. And his brother's coming. And he doesn't know what he's going to do. And it's in the middle of this scene that we have this incredible deus ex machina, which is a theater term for God just shows up out of nowhere. And God does show up and attacks Jacob, attacks him at his lowest point. He's face to face with all that he has been and all that he has done. God comes uninvited, unexpected, and is inhospitable and attacks Jacob. And they read, because there's nothing in the text to indicate this is horseplay. They fight all night long. And in fact, the Hebrew uh, author of this story is, is, is as confused as we are because this, this fighter, this wrestler is referred to as a man and other texts as an angel and even as God. So is it a man? Is it an angel? It's God. Who's Jacob wrestling with? And I would suggest he's wrestling with his own inner stuff as well as this other being. And so the fight goes on all night. And then it's becoming daytime and God is weary of the fight and pulls a fast one and throws Jacob's hip out of joint. But Jacob still won't let go. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And God blesses Jacob. It changes Jacob's name from Yaqub to Yisrael. And Israel in this text, is translated as one who wrestles with God. In another text in the Hebrew scriptures, Israel is translated as prince of God. But this is significant, this changing of the name, because it, it represents God changing Jacob's character. He's no longer little con man, little thief. He's now prince of God, or one who wrestles with with God. God has changed the nature of Yaqub in this all night wrestling match. So what is really going on in this story? And Phil, if you can put the slide up behind me, they don't need to look at me. I'm not a rock star. We don't need the, the big thing up there. But so, oh good. So this is a, a schema that was made famous by Joseph Campbell in his book, A Man with a 10,000 or a 1,000 Faces. And it's the story of, of not just Jacob, but of you and me, of all of us, that Campbell, and he's not the only one that has identified this process. Aristotle wrote about it thousands of years ago in his Poetics, which is his interpretation of the genre tragedy. And as Aristotle tried to explain what a tragedy is, he, this is the same thing he talked about. And the Christian theologian Walter Brueggemann, when he writes about the Psalms, the book of Psalms in the Bible, he uses this same thing. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. And, the, and the, here's, the, this is what it means. So Jacob came through life with a basic orientation. I'm a little con man, I'm a thief. I'm manipulative. That's who I am. That's my orientation. And through this night of wrestling, he is disoriented. It's turmoil. And he's reoriented at the end to become a nicer, more compassionate, wiser human being because he does reconcile with his brother Esau as the story unfolds. And he becomes one of the patriarchs. And this is our story as well. We go through difficult times. We have a basic life orientation. I'm not supposed to smoke or chew or date the girls that do. If I behave myself and volunteer to be in the nursery once in a while, if I give money to the church, then I will have health and my kids will obey me even when they're teenagers and life will be good. And that's a basic orientation we have. And then life happens and we get all shook up and we get disoriented. And hopefully we come out of the reorientation as wiser, kinder human beings. 
Now, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes people that get disoriented just become mean and bitter. And so it's not a guarantee that we'll, we will reorient in a wiser, more compassionate way. And so this story, I think, is not just about Jacob, but it's about us. And not just us as individuals, but us as a faith community. Because in this interim time, we are being disoriented. It's a great time of disorientation. The, the way we knew church life at the beginning of this year is really different now. Our pastor is gone. And that was not an easy going. And people's feelings are hurt. And who do we trust? And what do you believe? And all of this. It's very disorienting. And how long is this going to last? And when are we going to get through this? And what's going to happen next? We don't know. But I suggest that this disorientation process, what we call an interim period, can also be a work of grace to help shape and mold us to become wiser, kinder, more compassionate, individuals as well as a wiser and more compassionate community of faith in the city of Ashland in this time. The very wise Joan Chittister, who is a great, great spiritual writer, in commenting on this particular text that we're looking at this morning, has said that Jacob walks into the struggle but he limps out of it, permanently marked, forever changed. And she goes on to say, it's when we won't let go of a thing that we are defeated by it. Let me go, says the Spirit of God. And Jacob answers, I will not let you go until you bless me. And herein, lies the secret of winning all the struggles of our lives. We must learn to let go of them so that we can come to the blessings hidden within them. I want to read that again because I don't think you got it. <laughs> and therein lies the secret of winning all the struggles of our lives we must learn to let go of them so that we can come to the blessings hidden within them. The paradox is even though Jacob never quit struggling, he knew when to let go. And I think this is the task before us as a faith community at this, in this interim time, to continue to struggle but to learn to let go. To, to learn to let go of, of my right to be right and everybody listen to me. To let go of, of my opinion. We should. So that we can come together as a people and love each other and be representatives of this being we name God in this community in this time. There's a, and, 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 and people may ask, well, how long is this struggle going to go on? And what's going to happen? I don't know. Nobody knows. That's why it's a struggle. And it's hard. Because we don't know what we're going to be like at the end. We're going to limp at the end. But limping might not be a bad thing. If it has some humility and compassion and wisdom. That was a sign, actually, that Jacob was healed, was that he limped. That was the great sign of his healing. So what are we going to be like at the end of our interim period? No idea. My hope is that we will be wiser and more compassionate. That we will love each other for real and not just say those words easily. 
but that it will really mean something. That's my hope. And how long is it going to last? I have no idea. But it's going to take as long as it needs to take. And I'd like to conclude with a, with a wonderful story. It's an episode from Zorba the Greek by Nikos Kazanstakis. And in the story of Zorba the Greek, he shares this episode. He says, one morning, Zorba talking, I discovered a cocoon in the bark of a tree. And just as the butterfly was making a hole in the case preparing to come out, I waited a while, but it was too long in appearing, and I was impatient. So I bent over, and I, I breathed on it to warm it. I warmed it as quickly as I could, and the miracle began to happen before my eyes, faster than life. The case opened, the butterfly started slowly crawling out, and I shall never forget the horror when I saw its wings were folded back and crumpled. The wretched butterfly tried with its whole body to unfold them, bending over. I, I tried to help it with my breath in vain. It needed to be hatched out patiently, and the unfolding of the wings should be a gradual process in the warmth of the sun. But now it was too late. My breath forced the butterfly to appear all crumpled before its time. It struggled desperately and a few seconds later died in the palm of my hand. That little body, I do believe, is the greatest weight on my conscience. For I realize it is a mortal sin to violate the great laws of nature. We should not hurry. We should not be impatient. But we should confidently obey the eternal rhythm of life. How long is our interim period going to be? No idea. What are we going to be like afterwards? No idea. But I know we need to struggle and be in this place for as long as it takes. So that when we emerge from this time, as I fully trust we will, we will be what we are meant to be, that we will be healthy, that we will be loving, that we will be kind. And that is the gift this interim period has for us. Jacob never quit struggling, but he knew when to let go. And that is the work for us in these next few months, to continue to struggle and to try to sense and learn when to let go so that we might become what God does dream us to be. So it is time now for our prayers. And so uh, if you would join with me, we will pray the prayer that Jesus taught as translated by those wonderful folks in New Zealand from their book of common prayer. And we'll say this together. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be. Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of this world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. And the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. 
So thank you for all your gifts. Uh, remember reminders that you can give online at ashlandpeacechurch.org. Just click on the Give Now menu, or you can also choose text to give and uh, mailing a check to 717 Siskiyou Boulevard will also work. And thank you for all the gifts, both monetary and for your time and talents that you share with us. And we will now have Thanks. a closing, closing song, number 377, Forward Through the Ages. So our final blessing this morning comes from the wonderfully wise John O'Donohue. And he writes, you are in this time of interim where everything seems withheld. The path you took to get here is washed out. The way forward is still concealed from you. The old is not old enough to have died away and the new is still too young to be born. You cannot lay claim to anything. In this place of dusk, your eyes are blurred. There is no mirror. Everyone else has lost sight of your heart. And you can see nowhere to put your trust. You know you have to make your own way through. And as far as you can, hold your confidence. Do not allow confusion to squander this call which is loosening your roots from false ground, that you might become free from all you've outgrown. And what is being transfigured here in your mind, it's difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here in this place of interim, the more refined your heart will become for your arrival in the new dawn.
blessings and be nice to each other this week. Amen.